So good evening, everyone. My name is Danielle Applebaum, and I am the Scholarly Communications Librarian at the Thomas D. Greenlee Library. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the fifth virtual STEM poetry reading series here at Farmingdale State College. So funded by a 2022 Students First grant, this virtual series has two primary goals. First, to expose the FSC community to the work of poets writing about and or working within STEM. And second, to enhance the FSC's community engagement with STEM majors through conversation with authors about the synergistic relationship between STEM and poetry. So currently, camera and microphone access is disabled for attendees. So if you wish to make comments throughout the reading, please do feel free to utilize the chat feature. And of course, we'll make some time uh, for questions at the close of the reading. So if you've been to a poetry reading in the past, you'll note that ours has a little bit of a twist. Each of our poets will read for approximately 20 minutes, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion about the synergy between poetry and STEM work and vice versa. And we will end with a little challenge for the audience. So our first reader tonight is Laurel Anderson. Laurel Anderson is a plant ecologist and poet. Her poetry has appeared in Terrain.org, a semifinalist in the 12th Annual Poetry Contest, Echo Theo Review, Radar Poetry, River Mouth Review, The Fourth River, Split Rock Review, and elsewhere. Laurel teaches science at Ohio Wesleyan University and lives with her family in Central Ohio. Um, take it away, Lori. Thank you very much, Danielle, and thank you so much for hosting this reading and to Farmingdale State College for coming up with this great concept of the fusion of poetry and science. I'm really delighted to be part of this event. And I'll just start by uh, reading a poem that is inspired by one of my nature preserves at Ohio Wesleyan University where I work. A lot of my poems are taken or I guess inspired by my work as a plant ecologist in the outdoors. And I was thinking about our nature preserve as a place where I get to navigate with natural landmarks, and there aren't very many places that you get to do that. So this poem is called Navigation. Let me speak with a tongue of leaves, guide you by tremor of whisker to the hillside tumbling toward water, where a single lady slipper orchid spread her pink skirts above the dark soil that one remarkable spring. With a whiff of scent, you can find the fallen maple that cracked and crashed in the storm 18 winters ago. We can use the bowl as a compass to point to the glade by the river where the cliffside leans and threatens the evening but shelters six different velvets of moss. Let me feel the earth like a root, finding wetness by touch and by thirst, dividing itself into pathways and pathways. Let me speak in a language of beech drops and thorns, borrow from bats and no patterns of branches, crisscrossing the stars as echoes, Build my brain anew with magnets implanted so I know the tug of each pole in my sleep, in my feet feel always the hum of the stone. So in the last five years, there have been a number of scientific studies that have come out showing alarming declines in insect populations all over the world. And this next poem is inspired by those studies. Hashtag insect apocalypse, a thread. In a world where cognition is currency, we are the underclass. Forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain in miniature, just enough to keep the lights on. Yet we know beauty, green glimmer gloss of beetles, glitter pane wings and faceted eyes, tiny eggs afloat in jeweled froth stitched to grass. We know sickness, 
We bring nightmares of fever and rash, ache in the bone, twist of the bot fly beneath the taut skin. We know family. In a palace of paper and wax, her half-sisters hum as they circle the queen, feeding her, bathing her, tending her brood in their hexagon cradles. We know vengeance. The hornet that enters the hive as a hunter is surrounded, restrained, and roasted alive in the heat of 1,000 vibrating wings. We know love. We fly caresses of pollen from flower to flower so apples will weigh down branches in autumn and almonds will fill with sweet oil. We care for the dead. When a creature with fur or feathers lays itself down the last time, we unravel the threads of the body and sing them back into atoms. We were a multitude. Our abundance powered the flitter of bats, thrum of the bullfrog, skitter of lizards through mazes of stone. We die now as dust in mouths of dry rivers. We crisp in the noon of a day that melts tar. We emerge too early and starve without blossoms. We explode into splats on the windshield. We ash on a million hot light bulbs. We die twitching and slow in pesticide fogs that twist through green blades of corn. We know that you do not mourn us. You will. Erosion is, I think, one of the most underappreciated environmental problems that we have, but it's a major concern for my home state of Ohio, where agriculture is a major industry. This is a sonnet called Erosion Elegy, Ohio. In drought, wind lifts soil skyward like silty locusts swirling in particulate murmurations. In storm, rain pounds the fields to slurry, sliding into streams and lakes to feed the starving algae so they bloom a lurid green. Glacial ground, crop keeper, lost to us in less and muddy runnels as we plow and harrow. May you resurrect one day as black earth on floodplains. Scatter nitrogen largesse on hungry grassland. Grow corn and beans as reborn dirt. Bless those downwind, downstream. Now I'd like to talk about bar-headed geese. These amazing birds fly over the Himalayan mountains as part of their annual migration, and they do it in one seven-hour push and reach altitudes of more than 20,000 feet. And to cope with these uh, oxygen deficits that they experience, they have evolved larger lungs than most birds, and also red blood cells that are much better at picking up oxygen out of the air. To avoid strong winds, they cross the mountains at night. This poem is titled Mantras of Geese Flying Over the Himalayas. Lift from the lake when the sun goes to sleep. Begin the ascent when savage air stills. Rock rises ahead, streaked with snow in the seams. Wingbeat, heartbeat, air tastes of cloud. Breath starts to fray, lungs start to unravel. Climb the wind's spine by the rungs of your feathers. Mine oxygen now from hollow bone tunnels. Wingbeat, heartbeat, air tastes of ice. Cross over crest, squint in the spindrift. The wing is the hinge to the door in the sky. 
Begin the descent through thickets of stars. Wingbeat, heartbeat, air tastes of ocean. Working waves shine at the edge of the flyway. Fields below wax green in new light. Look for a place wide open for landing. Wingbeat, heartbeat, air tastes of grass. So the world of medicine is another place where the STEM disciplines, I think, can intersect with poetry in really interesting ways. And this next poem draws on my experience having a dangerous uh, complication of pregnancy called HELP syndrome. And in this situation, your liver actually uh, starts to fail and your blood does not clot properly and the baby has to be delivered early. So this poem is called Gestation in Pisces. You nearly drowned in oceans of dark blood while my liver erupted in panic like a megacity on the night of a hurricane when people pour out main arteries desperate to escape rising seas yet their own vast numbers clot the roads in all directions. Cut loose, you rode the heave and swell, and I listened to your voice crackle over the ship-to-shore radio. So many times we lost the signal and the chaplain stepped up in his black coat. Then you would paddle yourself back in range, your heart blinking red to port side, green to starboard, as we watched from the strand. When your skiff collapsed, you wove yourself a cradle of kelp, trusted our embryonic link with fish, kept swimming with cheeks ice blue and lungs half gills, eyes fixed on my beacon, until your grasp reflex closed on warm sand. So the climate crisis, of course, has entered many of my poems, and this is one where it features very prominently the title serves as the first line of the poem. The heat dome of 2021 trapped all the West in a carbon bell jar and the pulsing mercury stretched, reached, hung itself from the highest rung and all the threads of water binding root to leaf to sky snapped in gnarled necks of pines and bitter melons boiled on vines and workers slick with sweat picked flaccid cherries in the shimmer and cities glitter sweltered as people knelt with melting cells before fans that stirred a brew of fumes with a steady hum and air smelled of worse to come as flame dogs ran in eager packs through yellow grass, snuffling cracked earth and ash, and hills smoldered into dusk, so night was no relief, and mountains stripped of snow and cloud gleamed unsheathed in moonlight. All right, let's, uh, let's lighten things up a bit. Uh, this next poem is called Bog. Bog is nothing like meadow. Mother Nature's perky Avon lady flashing her lipstick blossoms for bees. Bog hums along with cicadas, weaves cranberry vines through her tousled cotton grass hair brews Labrador tea for one in her dilapidated house down in the tangled hollow. 
Born from glacier, Bog remembers the creak and crush of ice. Rose poison sumac on her undulating lawn for its bright red stems. Rises early to set insect snares. Sundews sparkle with sticky pink droplets. Pitcher plants open silver-haired lips into curved green throats. Evenings, bog rocks in the blue shadow of her porch, while her fence of fir trees leans round her kettle, reflecting like bristling arrows. Bog never throws anything away, so gray-green feathers of moss pile up like old magazines. Rumors are she keeps bodies in the basement. Her only friends are salt marsh and mangrove, too busy holding back storm surge to visit. Mosquitoes discourage the curious. Bullfrogs keep watch at the waterline while their eggs twirl like glass planets in peat dark galaxies. Bog asks nothing except not to be drained, filled, wished into cornfield or mountaintop. She is no garden of beauties minding their manners, blushing at a yellowed leaf. She is alive in soil that would suffocate rose roots. She never begs for nitrogen. She is the witch you cannot burn. She is the old crone in the fairy tale who knocks on your door for a drink of water, and she rewards those who fill her cup. I also wanted to have a poem where science fiction might intersect with poetry. So see if you can guess what this poem is about. A new hope. The point is, I was there. 10 years old, in a velveteen seat, in popcorn scented dark, with my tennis shoes stuck to the sticky floor. When the hyperdrive kicked in and stars stretched and a gasp sliced the lungs of the theater and every cinematic moon became a space station. This next poem is called Ars Poetica with Mushrooms. And Ars Poetica means the art of poetry. And this poem uses many scientific terms for structures in kingdom fungi. Ars Poetica with mushrooms. After rain, a spore drinks itself awake in the glimmered meadow. Hyphal hairs grow out from this center Nuclei flow in all directions. Subterranean threads weave a chitin mandala beneath the grass. At the hidden circle's edge, mushroom parasols unfurl in moon chill, cast a fairy ring of fleshy shade at noon to mark the whirl of secret dance. All through my concrete childhood, I long to live unpaved in a place where dance could shake and wake the earth. I believe dances done at the indigo hour when mist ghosted the river could coax strange fungi to rise and sway to roughed grouse drums throbbing in the black wood. I wanted to leave my body hot and twisted in damp August sheets eyes shut to neon glare. I wanted to shrink and sit quiet under a frost white cap, my head just brushing the pleated gills, mint scent drifting toward midnight, my back against a slender stipe, smooth and cool as stream washed quartz. I have two more poems for you. <clears throat> These are probably the ones that uh, kind of contain the most obvious um, information from my scientific background. 
and both of them contain some Latin names. The first one talks about phytoplankton, which are microscopic photosynthetic organisms that live in all natural water bodies. This is called prayer for the phytoplankton. Plus the diatoms encased in lacy nets of glass, <clears throat> turning in the drift like brides before the mirror. Bless the chill soil of their country on the underside of Arctic ice, where golden cells harvest trickles of light, feeding copepod, cod, seal, and bear. Bless the bear's great footfalls shaking the algae cities from above as Ursus strides the white crown of the world. Bless Spirogyra with its chloroplast coiled between clear walls like a green serpent. Bless colonial Volvox, whose cells gather in spheres and beat their whip tails in unison. Bless the unpronounceable coccolithophores, who bloomed in multitudes through deep time, whose bodies brighten the white cliffs of Dover and still ignite the southern ocean with gyres of turquoise. Bless the sweet sea broth the oyster pulls through its siphon, rich enough to shape into pearls. Bless the whales who quaff great mouthfuls as fuel for their long migrations. Bless the photic zone, thin layer of hope over fathoms of darkness. Bless the oxygen that swells half of all breath. Bless the secret glitter and pulse in each droplet. Bless the microscopic Milky Way that cradles us as we swim, drift, float, a single green cell shining in the void. I'll finish with this poem called, <clears throat> What is the Carbon Footprint of This Poem? A carbon footprint, by the way, is a calculation of all the fossil fuel resources used to produce a product. What is the carbon footprint of this poem? I can tell you the cost of the pen, notebook, laptop, computer, even the tuition that taught me to read and revere the meanings of words. But I have not tallied the weight of coal or water or acres of land or chains of sugar spun from light that were spent for this poem. True cost would include the fear scent of pine trees just before the bite of the saw jagged blue echoes off mountaintops before their removal, and the next line breaks should tumble and glitter like a poison stream splashing through acid mine waste. I should write in some fish before they are gone, describe their iridescent flash, perfect hinged jaws, solemn gold eyes. The poem says, add some frogs, with the right number of legs and smooth skin, unblemished by mycosis. If it could, this poem would fly you over leafscapes of rainforest canopy, hushed under mist at sunrise, then surprise with the throb and boom of howler monkey calls through the trees. If it could, this poem would take you somewhere so quiet you can hear erosion grind stones into sand. This poem knows there is such a place because it once crept in red shadows that settle in canyons at dusk and sipped at the silence collected there. This poem wants to bring you soft in cupped hands, a young bluebird with speckled brown feathers his adult blueness just starting to shine in his tail. This poem doesn't think this begins to make up for all that was lost, but this poem can only do what words born from darkness can do, make you love 
the broken world even more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. Uh, and now we have uh, Charlotte Pence. So what I am going to do, if you give me just a moment, we have some slides for you. So I am going to make sure that we can share those. Thank you, Lori. That was absolutely wonderful. Oh, yeah, there's my there's my little slide. OK. OK, and let me know, Charlotte, can you see the um, the uh, navigation bar under them? Yeah, let's see if I can um, click it myself. We'll give it a test here. Hmm. Yes, OK. Oh, OK, so you have full control it over it. So I will I will leave that to you and I will okay. introduce you. <laughs> Wonderful. So. Thank you so much for uh, for being here tonight. Charlotte Pence's new book of poems, Code, received the 2020 Book of the Year Award from Alabama Poetry Society and was a finalist for Forward Review's Indie Poetry Book of 2020. Code details not only the life cycle of birth and death, but also the means of this cycle, DNA itself. Her first book of poems, Many Small Fires, from Black Lawrence Press, won Forward Review's Silver Medal Award in Poetry. Both poetry books weave together personal experience and scientific exploration. She is also the author of two award-winning poetry chapbooks and the editor of the Poetics of American Song Lyrics. Her poetry fiction and creative nonfiction have recently been published in Harvard Review, Poetry, Sewanee Review, Southern Review, and Brevity. A graduate of Emerson College and the University of Tennessee, she is now the director of the Stokes Center for Creative Writing at the University of South Alabama. South Alabama. Uh, welcome, Charlotte. Thank you so much, Danielle. And again, thank you, Laurie, for opening us tonight with those excellent poems. I love how you're able to weave together the science with the lyrical poem. It, it really is inspirational. And of course, thank all of you for coming. Um, this is a pretty the, this this sort of the theme of STEM and poetry is one of my passions. Um, and I thought since this is so tailored towards STEM tonight that I would share with you all um, an earlier poem sequence that I wrote that I think really speaks to the convergence of the sciences with the arts. So I'm going to begin here with this first screen that is the mathematical definition of triangulation. So some of you might be really familiar with this. Um, the process of determining the location of a point by measuring the angles to it from another known point. So this is a mathematical concept, but it also can be used for mapping and for art <laughs> and also my um, poems. Um, what I have found is that I've taken this idea of triangulation, and this is not just me, other poets have done this as well. Uh, Ann Carson is someone who comes to my mind, where you take one subject that you know you're writing about, and you want to look at it through the lens of other subjects. And so for me, this would be through the lens of two other subjects, which is how we get this idea of triangulation. Um, so I had this um, chat book I'm gonna be reading from tonight called The Branches, the Axe, the Missing. And I had a fixed point, my, my subject that I wanted to write about. Um, and this was about my father's paranoid schizophrenia and chronic homelessness as a result. And that's what I wanted to write about, but I had not been able to write about it successfully. Um, it just sort of devolved a little bit into too much of a, of a one tenor sadness, right? Um, and you need more than that in, in a poetry book. I mean, you need more than that in sort of any book. So I decided that what I would do is figure out what could be my triangulation. How else could I get into this subject? And so for me, I became really interested in just the concept of home itself. Um, if my father was homeless, what did it mean to have a home, how was that decided? Who has the power to keep someone in the house versus out of the house? Who owns those keys, right? Who is given access to those keys? Um, but I was also wanting to really think 
larger here. And so I opened it back up to history. And I found that through looking at what anthropologists tell us is probably one of our first senses of home was like 15,000 years ago. Um, it's really a blink in the eye of the longer history of human evolution. And that's often the first agreed upon date of a human settlement 15,000 years ago. But with any sort of advancement, there's a trade off, right? Um, and so when people s settle into one community, now you're suddenly vulnerable to attack. And also the accumulation of things begin and that accumulation of things, of course, we all know um, creates its own problems, as we can see with capitalism and how it can create inequality um, and I would even argue slavery. And that was its, that was its other, the, those were some of the byproducts of settlement and home. But I wanted to dig more into just this idea of home and the concept of it. So that for me began a pretty intense series of research. And I'm going to start to read a little bit from this sequence now to give you a sense of how I started to use triangulation to tell my, my family's story. So this was the very first question that started this entire poetry book for me. And it was a simple little question. What small mammals did we roast in the fire? What first story did we tell? Something about longing, about loss, the big one, the got away. I don't know exactly what it was, but I was fascinated to think about that first moment sitting around the fire when someone was able to speak. And what was what would be the word? What would be the thing <laughs> that you would say when human speech was first possible? So let me continue on here. This sequence, you'll see it come up on the page. Um, it starts to talk about, of course, the past, and now we're moving into the present. And this was a time period right when I was going through a divorce. Turning into the driveway, her headlamps reveal something dark, light shining on darkness. A limb has fallen, 20 foot long and branded with many branches. It is 34 degrees, drizzling. She wants to be home, eat that leftover lasagna, drink a single glass of boxed red wine. The engine idles. She has just returned from her last act as a married woman, mailing the new ex his car title. He wanted a copy faxed and the original overnighted. She can hear now the car part that scrapes under the hood. She buttons her coat, lifts the collar, gets out, grabs the branch by the base. Her hands slide down wet slime of turkey tail mushrooms in bloom. She pauses, decides not to wipe off her hands. Begins again. It takes five tugs, a deep drag. The moon seeps through to shine. How long has it been since she has done something as fundamental as this? Cleared a path, been wet, been cold. The scent of wet dog shit limps over from the neighbor's yard. Their windows are ice black. Something about this feeling is honest, like nakedness, like this November moon, color of silk that is neither white nor silver, something she wants to conquer and can't. Um, um, so you can see it first began with this brief moment of wondering what it was that was set around the campfire and then it jumps to the contemporary world where we have all these different types of contained fire. We have the engine block, we have her thinking about the heater inside her house, thinking about microwaving leftover lasagna, right? All of this is different types of fire. But at the core though, she's just alone in the driveway trying to figure out how to get this branch. Again, something you'd used for fuel out of her yard. Um, all right, I'm going to just now let, I'm going to just start reading the poem and I won't interrupt it with the explanation so much just to give you a better sense of how the triangulation works. Now on my screen, I have this block that's kind of messing with what I can see, but I have my book here, so. Okay, last explanation, then I'll, then I'll really stop <laughs> talking. So one thing that I did was 
on the layout of the book, and this is what you see coming off here, is anything mm -hmm. that, what's that? Did you say something, Danielle? Okay. No, I um, think that was just some feedback. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Um, just making sure everything was working well with my with the PowerPoint. Um, anything you see here whoop, that's on the left hand side, this was going, I was always indicating with this margin, this is the more subjective interpretation of what's on the right hand side, which is what anthropologists have told us about evolution and what cooking allowed us specifically taming fire, what that allowed us and our physical forms. We were born from wood and fire, roasting small mammals as we sat in circles, the sizzle spit of fat striking flame. And outside the circle, darkness, stalk of hyena, crick shift of his step, then man lifting a torch, jab, jab, jabbing that dark until the sounds flee back to the quiet, sizzle spits. Shifts of logs carboned and bone thin, ashed by morning. Biological anthropologists are discovering that, quote, we're born from wood and fire, end quote, is less figurative than it seemed. Taming fire led to cooking, which led to more calories, which led to bigger brains, to language, speech, communities with clusters of moms, dads, bobbies, and sallies. But with everything gained, there is loss. What is the equation for this? Simply one plus one is no longer one. With taming fire, what was lost? The wet, the cold, makes her think of Spike, her father. Or perhaps what makes her think of her father is the house itself, its heater clicking on as she opens the door, the stargazer scent drifting from the hall, the red package log on the hearth, and the dog by this log, whining because it has not seen her in five hours. She has not seen her father in 15 years. He is homeless, a fact many friends don't even know. If she is asked why her father moved her family as often as every six months, she replies that he has a, quote, mercurial disposition, end quote, mercurial and SAT word. She does not know how to spell schizophrenic, but Ophelia, she learned in the third grade. Georgia, July, and the thought of ice storms occurred to her father. Fifty-three loblolly pines surrounded their house back then. Fifty-three pines that could ice over, splinter, crash the roof. They sat on their porch next to the strawberry patch that had given up only three berries all season. She rarely weeded. She was ten. Her dad liked quoting Frost in his proclamations of the world's end. In fire, some say ice. He kept ten full gallons of gasoline in the garage, one chainsaw. Cut to fall away from the house, those pines went down within seven hours. A boy biked by with his sister on the handlebars. She wore a headband with bunny ears, silver fabric where pink should have been. The sound of falling pines was new to her, yet recognizable. A sound slow to finish like stacked plates falling after an earthquake. Something impossible to stop, forcing one to stand by and watch. Just before dark, the chainsaw quieted and the bike squeaked by. The boy wore the ears now. There was no sister. She began her job of walking through each fallen treetop. Such rooms within those limbs. Sometimes she did pull up to the next furred space. Other times she ape swung and jumped down. In one nest weave, she found foil from a chip bag and one wobbly red piece of string. Two weeks ago, yeah, two weeks ago, she had torn her red dress at the edge of these woods. Aren't you one lucky kid, her father called from somewhere. She stopped moving, let the tree hide her, and it did, towering even as it lay on its side. I'm going to read just a couple more pages from this sequence. Upright but ape-like Australopithecines, knife-making havelines, maybe Homo erectus himself who was given a suit to walk the streets like any overlooked male. Maybe the first species 
to strike fire, did so by all lucky dumb. Some brute banging blind, pyrites against flint in hopes of her hammer. Or maybe some girl tripped, her deerskin shawl dipping into a gas-fired strip in Antalya. Or maybe our instinct to taunt led to fire. Cocky juveniles jostling each other with smoldering twigs after lightning struck the savannah. However the story began, we know its middles. Know how taming fire kicked us out of arrested development. We know we've experienced, we've experienced four major spikes in our evolution. Adding roots to the dialect of foliage, the first. Adding meat, the second. Adding cooking, the third. And language bottle rocketed us into the fourth. Fire and evolution converging, breaking box locked muscles, splitting barley seeds, sterilizing water secrets, equa tubers, cattails, water lily roots, all simmering in tortoise shells and surf family style around the fire where someone eventually thought to ask, how was your day? And what we ate changed our bodies. Smaller teeth, thinner guts, smaller teeth, thinner jaws, shorter guts, cooking, doing work our bodies once did. With this newly discovered time and energy, the body reorganized, gave less to the gut and more to the brain. Greedy for glucose, the brain gulped it all, gulped up more space, more thought, more this thing called self-aware, and now self-aware we've located and labeled it Broadma's Area 10. One last section. Feeding oneself one fruit, one nut, one leaf as monkeys feed ended with control of fire. We became communal, became communities of who does what, who scoops honey from hives, who cuts tongue from antelope, who scrapes corn from husk. We became arranged into cooks and hunters, husbands and wives, into worlds of many small fires and many small roofs, fathers and daughters, lovers and exes, connected by a desire to forget our histories. All right, and I will stop right there. Okay, great, thank you so much. You still have a couple of minutes if you'd like to do more. Oh, that's that's all right. We can okay. move on to the next section. Mm -hmm. All right, so. I'm actually going to uh, close out the sharing of these slides and bring us back to the original slides. So just give me one moment and we'll transition over. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so Again, thank you both so much for sharing your work. Uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to start this series was in part from reflecting on the intersection between information retrieval and poetry in my own work. And mm -hmm. so as a librarian, one of the things I need to be able to do is to retrieve published literature that are on topics that are both within and very much beyond my area of expertise. And so my ability to construct complex but concise search strings, um, to me in many ways, I think stems more from my study of writing and revising formal poetry than it does actually from the metadata classes that I took. So I think that poetry has had a huge impact on the way in which I consider select and arrange terms when I'm retrieving information. And I don't really think that I'd be as effective at this if I hadn't studied poetry. So along those lines, I have three questions for you. Um, so first, and you can answer them in any order, but I'll just, I'll read them out first for everybody. So first, how does reading and writing poetry impact your work in STEM fields or how you think about STEM related topics? And how does or how has your work in or with STEM fields impacted how you read or write poetry? And what do you think overall poetry brings as a medium to the exploration of STEM topics? Laurie, do you want to start or I'm happy to? Uh, I'll, 
I, I have some thoughts on that. But first, I want to say, uh, Charlotte, that was a fascinating um, connection to human evolution that you brought into that work. I really enjoyed seeing that and enjoyed seeing how that built throughout the piece. Um, so thank you. Thank you very oh, much for you. that. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think that something I have felt as I've continued in my scientific career is I've just noticed how much overlap there is in the way that you think about the world from a scientific point of view and the way that you think about the world from a, a poetry uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that I've noticed that I feel like cross the STEM and poetry disciplines are an appreciation of precision because every word matters so much um, in poetry and every word matters so much in, in scientific writing, but also in scientific observation, we're trying to be very, very precise. Also, there's a real um, desire to illuminate details of the world that people don't usually notice and understand them more deeply. And I think both poetry and science have that as kind of a mission or a goal. Yeah. And they both, especially in my field of ecology, there's a real desire to explore connections between things mm -hmm. that you didn't think were connected. And yeah. um, that really happens a lot in poetry too. It's just like Charlotte said, you know, in the, the story of a, a homeless father, there's definitely sadness, but there's actually a great deal of complexity and different mm -hmm. kinds of connections that you're making. So I feel like that's the same, you know, with poetry and science. Laurie, I love how you brought in um, ecology, because I think a lot of people think of that definition in terms of just like, oh, earth, trees, but one of the primary definitions of ecology is exactly what you said, bring the interconnectedness of, of everything. And so I, I'm not in a STEM related field. I am uh, Latin American literature was my undergraduate focus and then later on uh, kind of PhD in English. Um, but I am very, I just, in, I enjoy understanding the world in which I live and understanding the body in which I inhabit. And so for me, it is, I think, really necessary for writers to be able to have literacy in other subjects, right? Um, probably the same way it's necessary for scientists to have literacy in other subjects as well. Um, but I think one of the areas that's really interesting is when I ever am reading more scientific articles, it is how metaphor is used as a bridge, right? You know, we think of metaphor as heightened language, um, but it's also the way we transmit new knowledge to somebody else. So if you're trying to teach someone how to dive, let's say, and that they don't know how to do it, it will often be through metaphor or simile that we're able to communicate. Well, you know, tuck your head under like you're a seal trying to protect yourself, right? It's going to be some sort of connection to something that this other person knows as a way to make that bridge. Um, in my latest book, there's a lot of research I did into DNA, and it just was fascinating how much was used cookie metaphors. <laughs> um, it's a recipe. Um, it is, um, or it's, um, or going back to just basics of alphabets, right? Um, so it would be either connections with reading or connections with recipes, but it's taking it back to something that, that people know as you start to break down what exactly is a nucleotide and how does DNA replicate itself, right? Um, but there's so much more commonality between these fields that when you, when you start digging in, you realize, oh, these are just borders that people have had to create as a way to try to like, get yourself corralled into one area, right? But that that is just an organizing tool. It's not a principle of truth. It, it's just an organizing tool. Um, and so for me as a writer, it's about messing with that organization as a way to get to actually a, 
another type of truth to deeper truth. And I just also just uh, uh, before I forget, I also wanted to say um, a lot of what I was talking about, um, the man who is given a lot of credit for those ideas about cooking and how it changed the body um, is Richard Wrangham and Catching Fire, How Cooking Made Us Human was one of um, the texts that really influenced me. But his ideas have been very much corroborated at this point, but I just wanted to give him a little shout out. I'm glad that you brought up that uh, that point, Charlotte, about how metaphor is used in scientific communication. And I also think about my role as an educator. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm a science professor in my day job, mm -hmm. and I'm really trying to think about how to communicate about, you know, non-human and very non-intuitive uh, topics and often I am relying on some type of metaphor or it's rather like this, you know, some type of simile. And it's really helpful. Uh, people can then see things. Right. And I think that that poetry is really trying to illuminate connections through language. You know, it's trying to show like, oh, these things really are linked that you did not realize were linked. Um, through metaphor as well. So, so yes, it's, these are not as different areas a, as one might think. That it's so true. I mean, poetry is often about trying to take what is not seen and making it seen through language, right? Let's say an emotion or a thought. And then of course, I mean, it depends on the, the scientific subject matter, but oftentimes it's also about taking some of that, that people can't literally see, like let's say everything that the air is composed of, <laughs> and then articulating it and what it is, what what is actually there that we just are not exactly cognizant of, right? And then giving it terminology, which gives it life. And, and something that I'm really interested in is to what extent can art and poetry be a gateway to STEM fields. Um, mm. For example, if someone reads one of my poems, I guess my dream would be that they would see some kind of scientific topic I'm exploring and want to find out more because yeah. they read my poem. That would be a, a great honor <laughs> if that inspired, you know, future exploration for someone, uh, yes. more deeper exploration for someone. And I feel like, unfortunately, a lot of times in the sciences, we're writing in ways that are not very accessible to people. Mm -hmm. And I wonder to what extent poetry can be a gateway into scientific thinking. Because sometimes poetry isn't very accessible to people either. <laughs> Absolutely right. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I... I... I have run into a lot of poetry phobia <laughs> as I um, give readings like, oh, I don't understand that. Um, but the but yes, I mean, ultimately, I think that it, it's all about trying to create bridges in some way. Um, and I think you're right. I, I do very much feel like the poems that you read tonight, Laurie, it can provide more of an experiential meaning to what you're talking about people can like get a sense of the visuals get a sense of the the sounds of let you know the plant life that you're discussing or just what is in that landscape so i think that i think that is happening if someone is open to it i think that is definitely happening great i appreciate the <laughs> the, the the compliment of that um but the other thing I, I think, I mean, I'm looking at the question here, what does poetry mm. bring to the exploration of STEM? And mm. I realize that STEM does start with the intellect. You know, it's an intellectual mm -hmm. way of exploring the world. And the emotions are often set aside, which sometimes is helpful if you're trying to analyze something in a particular way. But yeah especially with environmental issues, I really wanted to be honest with myself and with my students about <laughs> the degree to which I'm emotionally connected to our natural mm. world. And mm -hmm. an analogy that I used recently is, 
you know, if your family was stuck in a burning house, you wouldn't save them because they're useful to you. And that's right. the argument, you know, that we're using so often in terms of environmental protection. We're saying, well, mm -hmm. we use these resources, we need uh, to preserve soil, you know, for crop growth, whatever else. But what about our love for the natural world? What about our personal connection? And my analogy goes, you know, you save your family because you love them. You don't save right. them because they're useful. And mm. let's be honest about that. Uh, let's have have a medium in which we can express our awe and sense of wonder at the natural yes. world. Um, and I don't think science does that very well, <laughs> uh, or it doesn't provide that type of, you know, ex expression. And I think that's really important as we are deciding what and how to conserve and support the natural world at this time. That that you're making a great point, and I hadn't thought about it quite in that way. But you know, to be taken seriously, the emotion often has to be removed. And I would say a journal article, right? Um, but yet, what you are pointing to is we're motivated by emotion <laughs> we're what we're much more you know feeling beings that occasionally think than we are thinking beings that occasionally feel <laughs> whether or not we want to admit it right um you know um but that yeah that that, that you're making a, a great point in terms of how to be effective in this fight for climate change right right yeah i, I think mm -hmm. i and and i don't want people to I mean, I also think it's not effective to be only emotional, but mm -hmm. neither is it effective to be only thinking <laughs> in this yes. situation. So that's right. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's a great discussion. Thank you so much for your input on these questions. I do have one more ask of you, and that is the audience challenge. So. <laughs> What is one thing that you would like members of the audience to think about in terms of the intersection of synergy between STEM areas and reading and writing poetry? Or if you'd like to suggest a challenge to our audience um, to write a poem of their own, what prompt might you suggest? And you can do both if you like as well. I am, um, I think that one thing to, to consider is how it is completely okay and necessary to not know what it is you're writing about at first or to not know what it is necessarily that you're looking for at first in if, if you're in, in the STEM field and moving into experimentation. Um, I'm going to, I'm paraphrasing here, but Neil deGrasse Tyson said, you know, science is always operating on the boundary between the known and the unknown. That's also literature, right? And um, I think especially with this college industrial complex that we have, it is very, it's very scary to not know the answer. Um, it's very, it can, it can feel honestly, even um, there are consequences for not having the right answer and not writing that essay correctly. Um, but that is where discoveries are made is in that time period of being lost in that time period of unknowing um, a lot of what I'm when I'm having to do my research for my poetry I don't understand a lot of it and that's humbling but th at this point in my life now it's energizing I'm like oh great I don't understand this let me figure it out so let me read more about it until I do understand it <laughs> um, and so a lot of that I do with my with my students uh, and more so with my graduate students than my undergraduates, um, is try to get them at a place of playing, just saying, I, I'm, I, we're, we're just, we're just going to go to the sandbox right now. We're not, this isn't for real. We're just going to play in the sandbox and let's just start sketching out some things that you are not sure about. And so just to be a little more welcoming of those areas that we don't know the answers to as a way of being able to figure out something new and exciting. 
Very cool. Yeah, I think I'd like to try both of these. So one of them, the first one is one of the things you'd like your attendees to take time to consider. Mm. <clears throat> I would like people spinning off of the discussion we just had to really think about what science can contribute to the solving of environmental problems. Mm. And then what is the role of art as well? Yeah. Uh, and how can the two work together? So thinking about whatever environmental issue is most compelling to you, you know, what are the scientific, what tools do we need from science and what tools do we need from art? And mm -hmm. uh, really bringing both of those, the power of both of those disciplines and the crossover between those disciplines to bear on those environmental issues. Mm-hmm. And then that's, this is just coming. I love oh, that. I love that, Leslie. Yeah, I, I think that that's what we need to all be thinking about right now. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I, you know, we could take it further. What what are the social sciences? What do they need to contribute? Um, and and something else is, you know, I I really enjoy working on my poetry as well as working on my science. but. I, I'd also really like to teach my students to be part of interdisciplinary teams, you know, really mm. think about you don't have to embody all of these different disciplines within yourself, but you need to know enough about these things so that you can see the value in your teammates and see what they bring to the table. So mm. I'd really like to think about how we can move forward using each other's talents and each other's skills in really effective ways to help the environment. Um, for, for a poem prompt, uh, this is something that, you know, is obviously emerging from my own work, but I'll tell you something that I sometimes enjoy. So one of the things that that is interesting in poetry is that prompts uh, or, for, or poetic forms often constrain you. For example, the, mm -hmm. the sonnet puts kind of a box around what you can write. It's 14 lines. Um, you can choose to have the lines rhyme or off rhyme at the end or not. But the fact that you're constrained often pushes you toward creativity in interesting ways. And I'd like to suggest that people take a scientific fact that they know something about or a scientific topic and you're constrained, your constraint that is supposed to push your creativity is that everything in the poem has to at least harken back to a scientific truth. In other words, you can't write a poem that you know, expands out of what is scientifically known about that area. But within those constraints, you can create beauty and interest and meta use metaphor and do all the things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I find that um, a really interesting constraint. <laughs> I love that. Um Laurie, going back to what you're, I, I like how you're thinking about how can scientists and writers work together in terms of ecology and and climate change. I've been reading more about um, perhaps narratives are one of the tools that we haven't employed enough because at this point there there's there's enough research, right? <laughs> we know what the problems are and we know the causes. But what is it emotionally that is not making this happen? That that's right. not moving us into the action that we need to do. Um, and I've, I've been hearing more talking people talking about like you have with um, religious conversion tales, climate change conversion tales of people like publishing personal narratives um, about like so I live here in Mobile, Alabama. It's you know, exit zero off of Interstate 65 where you plop into the Gulf. <laughs> um, 
And we are getting, I mean, the, the, the storms at this point are, are so strong and so frequent. Um, but perhaps more stories from people who once didn't think that they were going to be affected now are talking about the actual changes that, that they're experiencing and seeing in their everyday life, um, that these personal narratives might help in this in this fight that we're all in um but anyway going to the the prompt it's so interesting i had a similar i had a similar prompt but from the other direction um one thing that one prompt that i've done in in class before is i will have students just start writing i with the phrase i don't know i don't know and then just look around you um i i i don't know exactly how the varnish sticks to the wood on this desk before me. Um, I don't know how this thing that I carry around with me all the time actually works, right? And just um, having, just start like riffing, don't go into anything deep, but just start listing everything that you don't know. And then later, let it sit a day or two, and then go back to it and see if you're noticing anything there that you'd like to explore in more depth. And then perhaps research can be brought into something that you don't know. I like that. I, I like the fact that you're, you know, kind of using your intuition to uh, to direct you toward topics that you want to find out more about. That's very cool. Yeah, yeah. That, that that's the hope. That's the hope. Well, those are some great prompts. I do have a couple of comments, but before I say anything, I okay. do want to remind folks that you uh, have an opportunity to plug your questions into the chat box area. So if you have any questions, please feel free to go ahead and plug those in now and we will get to them um, before the end of the session. But there are, there are a couple of things I, I wanted to come back to um, and that one of the things was um, what you mentioned, Charlotte, about playfulness. And I, mm. I definitely find working in uh, higher ed that there's kind of a resistance to playfulness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, even when I'm working with students to figure out what they want to research and how they want to go about researching it and how they want to look up the information. And sometimes a trick that I use is I tell them to think about, about it just as data. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. We are being playful and thinking about all the things we could do, and that is our raw data. And eventually, yeah. we're going to narrow it down into what, where we do want to go. And it's you're probably going to be surprised about where you want to go because until you write it down, sometimes you really don't know what your direction is. Um, but true. yeah, I, I often ask. I just say, think about it. Think about your outlining and think about your, you know, you know, just writing down what you might do as raw data. But yeah, it is. It's so strange how it, there's there's kind of a there's kind of a resistance to that. It isn't taken as seriously, you know. But well, I, I mean, to, to be fair, I mean, a lot of the skills that has allowed someone to be able to go to college, that that playfulness has had to be squashed at times especially yeah. in high school I mean it, it, the demands between academics and sports and then of course economics just helping to pay for college um, working while you're in college taking care of other family members it it, it 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 can really make play seem like this thing that is just um, not there's no time for and that it's not necessary and it actually could be damaging yeah. And also another thing I wanted to come back to is actually in the first set of questions, but um, this idea that both of you touched on about, you know, the the benefits of using poetry to explore uh, STEM topics. When I was applying for the grant that's supporting this reading series, one of the things I was really surprised at finding was a lot of research on how um, poetry can help folks in STEM areas unpack ideas mm -hmm. and repackage them for understanding. So one, one example is a study of uh, anatomy and physiology students who had to come up with limericks about a particular area of the body. And then they ultimately oh, shared funny. it out with the whole class and the class who used the limerick uh, intervention uh, 
did significantly better than the class that didn't. And it was just, you know, so interesting about like, yeah. we're often afraid of the, you know, poetry as like its yeah. own kind of language, but sometimes it can help you understand the language of your own field. Mm -hmm. Really good point. I mean, often if you can rephrase something in your own words, and if you're being challenged to do that, you know, with lyrical or poetic types of language, I can really see that how, how that would deepen understanding. Absolutely. That's very cool. Okay, so I am looking at the chat. I'm not seeing any questions. Um, so I would like this time to say thank you so much, uh, Lori and Charlotte, for reading tonight. Um, Again, this was terrific. This is a great discussion. The video will be uh, up on the library's uh, page uh, where we have all of our reading series. So that should be up by next week. If anybody would like to come back to it, you'll be able to access it um, either through our Greenlee Library YouTube channel or directly from the library homepage. So um, with that, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. It was great. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, you having me. Yes, thank you very much. I love being part of the event. And of course, thank you everyone for coming. Really appreciate it. Have a good Thanks, night. Thanks everyone. everyone. <laughs>